and it is um, chapter four, and it looks like it's verse four. I'm not sure. No, verse one through six, okay. So surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evil evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. And then you will trample on the wicked, and they will be ashes under your souls, on, of, of the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. May God bless our understanding of his word. Today's gospel is parable of the lost son. From the gospel according to Luke chapter 15, and it's going to be verses 11 through 22 uh, this week as we're going to be uh, looking at this parable for, for a few weeks. Um, I would ask that uh, God bless us in our hearing, open our hearts, open our souls that we might hear something very special that God is just intending for us. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the youngest son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one even gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. So, today we, we talk about the first, first part of this uh, story that, uh, to be honest with you, it's probably why I, I became a minister. It's probably what led me on that path. It's my favorite parable. And, um, I want to give you a little bit of context uh, for this. And it's, it's hard to remember that, um, who Jesus was, where he came from, and, and we've sort of uh, drifted far afield from that sometimes. And, and we get interpretations out of, out of uh, that, that just never would have occurred to the people Jesus was speaking to. 
And it, I think it's important and helpful to know who he was speaking to so we can get a context to, to understand what he was trying to get across. And then we can translate that to our own time today. Uh, parables by their nature, and, you know, and what we like to do is strip a, a story down or a parable down so it's about one simple thing and I could get, stealing's bad, I got it. You know, and that's not really what a parable is. A parable is meant to be disturbing. It's meant to uh, kind of rock us out of our comfort zone. So if I read a parable and I'm comfortable with it, I need to keep going back and reading it until I'm disturbed, until something bothers me, so that I can wrestle with it and get to a deeper level of what God's trying to say to me. So the first thing that Jesus opens with in this is a man had two sons. Now to the first century Palestinian Jews that Jesus was talking to, they knew a lot of stories where a man had two sons. They've been hearing them their whole lives. They, they knew a lot of stories where men had multiple sons. And you know who the best son is? The youngest son. The youngest son's always the best. Abel. Abel's the righteous one. Cain's a creep. Right? Solomon. He's not the oldest son, but he's the wisest. David's the youngest son. David's going to be the hero that's going to liberate Israel. Jacob and Esau. Esau is the rightful heir to Isaac, but, but J Jacob's too smart. And he tricks him out of his inheritance. So the youngest son, so they've heard a bunch of stories where the youngest son is the smarter, he's clever, he's better. And here, in this story, Jesus immediately, he's always, Jesus is always throwing curveballs. He never threw a fastball down the middle of his plate in his life. He's always throwing curveballs. And Jesus makes the youngest son a degenerate. You know, he's irresponsible. And, and we've, we've heard a lot of stories where, that, you know, it was this. It wasn't this horrible thing to ask for your inheritance. It, it, it was not that uncommon. It was a little, a little bit of impropriety, but it certainly wasn't sinful. Uh, in reality, the, the sin would have been on the part of the father if he was being irresponsible and giving a kid money that he couldn't handle. But that's for another day. So really, the, the son has a plan, he gets his inheritance, and, and he takes off. And <clears throat> things don't go well. You know, they go well for a while, they go well for a time, and then his plan go, somehow goes terribly awry of uh, things he hadn't planned, having a famine hits, his money's gone, he can't get any uh, food, he's starving to death, he degrades himself to the point where he works as a, a, a pig herder, which is the, the absolute lowest lowest uh, form of employment for a, a Jewish person in the old world. That would not have happened. That wouldn't have been a, a good thing. But he's starving to death. He's desperate. So he takes this job and he's still starving to death. And he comes to his senses. Okay. Uh, a lot of times they make this story about repentance. He repents. He goes back. And the words Jesus uses in the apology are, are really important. Because what they, and, and you know, I think we're all supposed to read this and get our, and listen for ourselves. But what it says to me is, this kid is in no capacity repentant. He's going back because he comes to his senses and he's starving to death. He's not repentant. Repent, the Hebrew word for repent was shuv. It just mean, it means to turn. To turn away from one thing and, and to turn toward another thing, hopefully the right thing. And he does turn away from starvation and turn toward his father, but his heart really hasn't changed. His heart really hasn't changed. And spiritual transformation is about a change of heart, a change of spirit. And that hasn't changed. He's still in it for himself. He's still trying to preserve himself and he doesn't want to die. He doesn't want to starve to death. So that's his motive for going to the Father. It's not necessarily a lofty motive. It's, it's one of self-interest. So he decides to go to the Father and the words he uses, and he's rehearsing them. You know, and, and I think we might, might have even talked with, about this with some of the members of the search committee when we were talking about a, a parable. I don't know how this came up, probably because it's my favorite, and I always try to bring it up. But the kid is rehearsing his father. You know, and I imagine him being like, 
Father, I have sinned against you. Now, wait a minute, that's not. Yeah. Father, I have sinned. For, you know, I just imagine him walking all the way home, rehearsing this. I'm going to nail this. I'm going to get it right. And I think, I don't know if we can all remember back to those days, but I did that like a thousand times. How can I fess up to this to the old man without really getting the hammer on this, with the hammer coming down? How can I, you know, admit what I've done because I know he knows? <laughs> so I might as well pretend I'm confessing something. Ah, Dad, I did this. Yeah, I know. I know three hours ago. Get in your room. You know, how can I soften this? So the kids got this speech rehearsed and planned. And the words he used are a little bit familiar. You know, I've sinned against you and against God. Those are the same words that the Pharaoh from Egypt uses way back when he's got the plagues on him. Jesus knows that. That's why he picked those words. He's telling us this kid is a fraud. He's insincere. He doesn't mean a word of this. And he's saying, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against God. That's exactly what Pharaoh says. Yeah, Moses, I've sinned against your people, against God. Can you get rid of the locusts? Moses says, okay. God blows the locusts out to the sea. And then what happens? The Pharaoh doesn't change a thing. So to repent, the heart needs to be changed. The heart, and repentance isn't an apology. It's a shift of heart. It's a change of heart. And maybe I'm a little tough on the kid, on the prodigal. And I usually am because I am that guy. And I'm always most cruel to myself whenever possible. You know, try not to do that, but that's my, our instinct is to be very hard on ourselves often. So the kid doesn't have a shred of sincerity in him. He comes home, he's got his rehearsed apology, and what happens? <clears throat> you know, the father sees him from the hill, and the old man runs down the hill. He doesn't jog down the hill, he doesn't walk down the hill, he doesn't say, oh, I think your brother's home, I think my son's home. He runs down the hill, can't wait to see the kid. Can't wait to see the kid. The first thing he does is throw his arms around him. The kid's trying to fire off. Wait a minute, I've been rehearsing this for three weeks while I walked here. Let me get this in. Then it's like, Father, I have sinned. Father completely ignores him. Doesn't even pay attention to him. Totally blows off the kid's phony apology. Has no interest in it. He's too busy loving this kid. He's throwing his arms around him. He's like, my son who is dead is back. He doesn't have time for this, the apology is absolutely meaningless to the father. What was important was that the kid showed up. He showed for whatever reason. You know, maybe there's a little uh, spiritual compass inside us. And for me, maybe what triggers that is desperation. No, it doesn't have to be that way. Like, we can always turn toward God before it's the absolute bleakest moment possible. That's not how I roll. You know, usually I, I'm not motivated by carrots. I'm always often motivated by sticks. You know, I, I wish, I, I think I'm a little better than I used to be, but I think I'm still mostly motivated by pain rather than uh, joy. And the kid waits to the last moment until it's so bleak, he's starving to death to turn to God, turn to his father, and that's good enough. That's good enough. The father... Couldn't be happier that the kid's there. Doesn't, isn't interested in the motivation. Isn't interested in the apology. Is too busy ordering robes and sandals. And in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about what that means. Because it, it means something that he gave him his robe. That would have meant something to them in that day. That it wouldn't necessarily mean. You know, if I showed up and I needed 200 bucks to fix my muffler and my father gave me his robe, I, I don't know that I'd be all that ecstatic about the robe. But in first century Palestine, in this story of a man had two sons, it means a lot. The sandals mean a lot. So Jesus is telling us a lot of stuff in this, in this little parable. Um, you could take away so much from this. This would probably horrify you, but we could do the lost son for months. We could do it for months and uncover uh, new things and go in that inner spiral staircase deeper and deeper toward what God's trying to, to reach out and touch us with. Um, 
in that first segment of our discernment as a group, as a church, uh, you know, who are we? You know, who are, who is, who is the son? You know, is he, uh, you know, a drunkard? Uh, you know, uh, whatever you would call a guy who does that other stuff that he's doing. Is he a, a wastrel is one of the words. I, this week, uh, I really, I love this parable so much. And it was really a busy week here at Chaffin, but it was a fun week for me because I just immersed myself in this parable. And I read a lot of stuff by a lot of really uh, wonderful uh, people. And, uh, you know, who, who is this kid? You know, who is this kid? Is he just a, you know, a degenerate? But the most important facet of who he is, is that he's his father's son. You know, it's not necessarily about him, who he is. Who is he? You know, he's one of God's kids. And that's probably the most important thing I'll remember, if I remember it today, about myself. Whatever all the surface stuff I tell myself, well, what are you? I'm a, oh, I'm a husband, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a Patriots fan, I'm a pastor, blah, blah, blah. The most important thing I can remember is that I'm, I'm one of God's kids. I'm one of God's kids. And in the end, the God uh, we really believe in, and we're going to work to find out what, what that is. Like it's to say, well, I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. I believe, that those are intellectual concepts. How we manifest in our lives is what we, what we really believe. So we want to find out what we really believe and get that closer to who God's calling us to be. And in this parable, I think we're being called to do our best to be that merciful father. Sometimes we, we say that this parable is about forgiveness. I wouldn't go there either. I don't think the father needs to forgive the son because he, he doesn't spend any time on it. The kid shows up, he's apologizing. The father doesn't say, I forgive you. That I find interesting, that he doesn't even feel there's anything to forgive. The kid is who he is. He did what he did. He, you know, he, he is who he was. I'm, I'm imagining this kid was who he was in middle school. You know, in kindergarten, in high school, as he progressed through life, there was no illusions about who this kid was to the father. And the father adores him, maybe not even in spite of who he is, but maybe because of who he is. You know, I reshaped God in my own mind, uh, through my own path, many, many times. And one of the prevailing conceptions I had of God was that God was pretty much disappointed in me. You know, I hadn't done a little more with what I had. And I have that in common with the prodigal. He, he shows up expecting his father to be as disappointed in him as he is in himself. And, and he's shocked when he doesn't get that response. You know, he's blown away. I don't think he really knows how to react. He's just shell-shocked by the fact that his father just couldn't love him enough. And I often think, Boy, I, I, you know, and we do need forgiveness, and we do need to forgive one another. But I walk around with this idea that, gosh, boy, God must just be up there wondering what I'm doing with my life and how I've gone so far astray. And in reality, maybe God's waiting at the top of the hill just for me to turn onto that road. Maybe my motives don't even have to be that good. If I could just turn for whatever reason toward God, maybe, maybe, God's waiting to run down that hill and embrace me and welcome me home. Amen.